So I've been looking forward to doing this talk for a long time. It's um, perhaps not the most important talk I've ever given, but it's the one that really, I think, has got me more excited than any other in its preparation. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, but I think it may be something to do with the fact that this really is the revelation of what we are. And the truth about what we are is absolutely fantastic. And we are used to uh, perhaps being self-critical or hearing about what's wrong with us in one way or another, whether it's somebody else telling us or us telling ourselves, and maybe we or they are right. But there's another side to this, which is an extremely inspiring, uh, confidence-boosting message. So I'd like to start with a very short personal story. A few months ago, I did something very stupid, something which I know better than to do, uh, but I did it anyway. I thought it would make me happy. And of course it didn't. It was an utterly stupid thing in every respect. I'm not going to tell you what it is, I'm afraid. <laughs> Confession is sometimes an indulgence. Um, but I thought about it afterwards. I thought, well, the good thing, if there's any good thing about this, is that I know not to do it again. Uh, and then I thought, yeah, but wouldn't it really have been much better if I'd known that before I'd started? I kind of knew that I shouldn't be doing it and that it wasn't a good idea and that it wasn't really going to make me happy. But I didn't really know it. But after I'd done it, I knew it better. How could I have known it better? How could I have known well enough in advance to guide me not to do it? And the answer to that is to know the higher self better. One of the great things about the higher self is that it saves you time. It saves you time spent in mistakes. Because if I had had a better contact with my higher self, or if I'd bothered to ask my higher self, if I hadn't ignored my higher self, I would never have done this thing. And it would have saved me that experience. It's by far the better way to go. There's this idea that, you know, we need every experience, and it's not really true. We need to understand every experience, but we don't need to go through every experience in order to know that it's wrong. You don't need to jump off a cliff to know that it's not a good idea. You know, you, well, your, your ordinary conscious mind can tell you that, but your, your superconscious, uh, your higher self, certainly would tell you that. So what is this higher self? Um, science doesn't really believe in it, but uh, it will, because it, is, it is really is part of our, our being. So I'm going to draw a little pie chart, and there's a reason why I'm picking the, the bottom of the paper. Okay. Now these are, the, the size of these portions is, is not significant. We call this the higher self. And then we also have the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And I've deliberately made it so that it's not just higher self, conscious, subconscious, because sometimes the higher self and the subconscious can work together without going through the conscious mind. So the conscious mind is what we think with most of the time, if not all of the time for most of us. It's what we're thinking with now. 
It's what you, you're, you're listening to this lecture with. It's what you make ordinary decisions with. It's what um, processes the senses and so forth. The subconscious, uh, as many people probably know, deals with physical functions, amongst other things. It also deals with memory. So it'll deal with things like digestion, and it will also remember absolutely everything. And not even just in one life, but through all lives. It has a complete record of absolutely every experience we have ever been through. So in that way, it's very much superior to the conscious mind, which only has access to a fraction of that information, ordinarily speaking. And then the, the, the higher self, also known as the superconscious, is that part of us which receives inspiration. Thank you, Humphrey. Is that part of us that receives higher inspiration, spiritual inspiration, that feels compassion. Um, and it's the job of the conscious mind to be open to this. Uh, and when the, the conscious mind is not open to that higher inspiration, that unselfishness, we've got one, thanks, uh, then uh, we have what, what, what you could call um, a condition of the lower self. Now, the lower self is not inherently part of our beings. It's not like there's a higher self part of the brain and a lower self part of the brain. The lower self is a perversion of nature. The lower self is when the conscious mind does not listen to the superconscious mind. So the conscious mind just does whatever it feels like. A good analogy is that the superconscious is the king and the conscious is the servant of that king. But the conscious, by and large, rejects the king and does whatever it likes, the result being chaos. And this is the state we see in many people's lives, perhaps most people's lives, on earth to some degree or another. Uh, and it's a reflection of the whole of this play. So I'll give you an example to make it more, more understandable. If your average person wins £10 million on the lottery, do they think, how can I use this resource to be of the greatest good uh, for the most people? This is not the question that people ask, is it? Uh, they may want to help friends and family a bit. They may even give a bit to charity. But overwhelmingly, the assumption is that this is for their own pleasure, their own selfish pleasure. Not necessities, unnecessary, completely superfluous pleasures that probably don't really make them happy anyway, which they might even agree with, but they still do this. And people don't even think there's anything wrong with it. They might even be admired and celebrated for this. This is the conscious mind uh, suffering from this lower self sickness, mental sickness. It is a mental sickness. If the uh, conscious mind were to be cured, of this lower self sickness, then it would listen to its higher self, our higher selves, our super conscious minds. And it would use that money in the best possible way to bring about the greatest good for Earth. The conscious mind being in the lower self state is the result of ignorance. I don't mean lack of academic education, I mean spiritual ignorance, a lack of wisdom, if you like. And uh, this ignorance is the wrong belief uh, that the conscious mind will be happier doing whatever it likes rather than following the dictates of the higher self. 
but eventually the conscious mind will realize that it is in fact better off following the higher self. Um, in this lower self state, if it's acute, uh, then I don't think the mind is really even capable um, you know, of anything other than carrot and stick uh, mentality, that it will do whatever is best for it. So if in this acute lower self state, the conscious mind can be convinced that actually it's better even for it, never mind everybody else, to follow the higher self, then this is a path to, to, to spiritual success, or at least the beginning of spiritual success. And, and when the conscious mind rids itself of this lower self state uh, and uh, obeys the higher self, then it will feel compassion and experience inspiration and it will advance. These things come from, or at least through, the higher self. When we experience them in our conscious minds, that's where these things are coming from. When the conscious mind obeys the higher self, it is enabling the higher self to express itself. Otherwise it can't, or at least not fully. And we've all got higher selves right now. Mass murderers have got higher selves. But without the conscious mind uh, allowing and wanting that higher self manifestation, then the higher self is, is powerless uh, to act, except insofar as trying to give promptings to the conscious mind. But it, it can only act through our conscious minds in terms of bringing about our own spiritual evolution. Because we've all got a higher self. It's a matter of allowing it to act through the conscious mind. That's what really matters. It's not getting yourself one. It's getting it to function through the conscious mind. It's kind of functioning all the time anyway, or at least it's set to function. But it can't do much, really, unless we let it with our conscious minds. And this is the difficult thing, because our conscious mind resists it, because we're all, to some degree or another, in this lower self-conditioned state. So how do we contact this higher self? Um, there are many ways. Uh, some are easier than others, some are more effective than others but all of them will have difficulties attached to them. One way is through yoga breathing, as taught in this wonderful little booklet, which is called Contact Your Higher Self Through Yoga. And it does mean exactly that, that you can or you will contact your higher self through these yoga breathings. It's literally true. There's this part of us the higher self that we're not in contact with, by doing these breathings, we will become in contact with it. As long as our motive is right. Uh, and I think if we do the breathings properly, um, even if the motive is maybe slightly off, that motive will be transmuted in an ordinary person over time because the higher self will begin to shine through just by virtue of doing these breathings and these affirmations. All true spiritual practices will help us to contact our higher selves. Mantra, prayer, uh, and so forth. And one of the things that will help more than anything else is by helping others, which is a result of the higher self in the first place. I mean, really helping others, not, you know, 
giving people nice Christmas presents because you like them. I mean, really actually making a proper difference to people who need it, or animals who need it, or even plants who need it. Being of proper, unselfish service. This is a result of the higher self, but it is also empowering that connection with it, that awareness of it. And it's making it easier. You see, the more in contact we get with the higher self, the, the more we're winning the battle against this lower self-sickness. We're curing ourselves of it. Another thing we can do is listen to it. Um, it is the, the source, uh, or at least the channel for, intuition, which sometimes can be quite... Um, an everyday sort of thing, and sometimes extremely important, affect our whole lives and future lives, whether or not we listen to this intuition. So the more we do listen to it, to the intuition, the stronger the voice will get, or rather the, uh, the better we will hear it. The intuition is always there, and it's always right. It's just that we don't listen to it, or that we can't make it out amongst the, the, the din of emotional shouting going on in our brains about what we want, what we like, what we fear, what we kind of half remember, things like that. The mind will be clearer such that it can identify the voice of the intuition, and also has the discipline to, to hear it and make out exactly what it's saying, even if it doesn't like it, which may often be the case. So the more we listen to the intuition, uh, which is an aspect of the function of the higher self, then the, uh, the greater this faculty will be within us. So I'd like us now to put everything down on the, the, the floor and we're just going to do a very brief contemplation. We're just thinking about the higher self, because I think this is another way to gain contact with it, is to uh, welcome it into our lives, to want that contact, to think about it. I've been doing this a lot recently uh, with regard to this talk. Um, so let's close the eyes and um, sit straight if we can. And close the eyes, and breathe through the nose if we can. Maybe, Jeremy, you could dim the lights if you're able to do that. Maybe some blue. Dr. George King, whose teachings are, of course, an in the inspiration for this talk, has said that there is a part of the brain that deals with the superconscious. Physically, it's very small, this part of the brain, but that doesn't mean to say that um, the superconscious is in any way inferior, of course, quite the reverse. So, now let's just think of it. Here we are thinking with our conscious minds. Now let's just think upwards that we've got a part of us that is above this, a part of us that is inspired, a part of us that is completely compassionate and unselfish and wise. It's kind of everything that we want to be on a good day. everything a spiritually minded person should want to be. It's completely together, for want of a better word. It doesn't have phobias or anxieties. It has desire. Desire to do good. Desire to know God. But it's, it, it, it is in perfect mental health. 
And if we can let all this amazing stuff about the higher self filter down, shine down into the conscious mind, then we will enjoy these things ourselves all the time, consciously. And we will cure ourselves of lower self-sickness. So there's this amazing part of us that really is part of us. It's not an extra add-on that some people have and some people don't. It's inherently part of us. It's just as much, if not more, part of us than our ordinary conscious minds. And it's certainly more a part of us than our physical bodies. You can even try talking to it in your mind. Greet it, welcome it. Ask it to, ex to explain to you what it really is. What's it thinking now? Where is it exactly? We'll come on to that a bit later on. Carry on in silence for one minute. Now that's the, uh, the, the, the basic outline of what the higher self is. And it's probably not very different to um, the teachings that you might find uh, in certain other spiritual traditions or New Age approaches to life's questions. But what I'm going to move on to now really is completely unique. And it's quite a lot to take in, in terms of um, its unfamiliarity uh, and our understanding. And it begins with a space contact that took place in 1958 between Dr. George King and um, an extraterrestrial intelligence uh, who he uh, met by arrangement uh, on Putney Common, of all places, which is not far from here. Now, this being uh, was from the planet Mars. There is intelligent life on Mars, but it is not on this plane, uh, this material plane of Mars. So if, ma if, if, if an astronaut flies to Mars, then um, they probably won't find any trace of Martian civilization because it is all on a higher energy level. This higher energy level is still physical, but it's physical on a higher, uh, at a higher vibration. 
So there's nothing um, believing in this kind of life on Mars. There's, science does not understand it, but there is nothing unscientific about it. Um, because um, science does not contradict that there is life at a higher frequency. Science doesn't understand higher frequencies. I have to explain that just so that you don't think that we're all crazy to believe in beings on Mars. But it's not really the, the point uh, that I want to make because it's not really about the fact that the being is from Mars. It's more about what the being had to say. And this is recounted in the journal, the Ethereum Society's journal of the time, Cosmic Voice, volume 17, which is available now on CD. And the article, is called, the, the article about this written by Dr. King is called The Spiritual Nature of Man, which is a, a very much more significant title than I think at first it appears to be. And I'll talk about that later. So during this contact, this being uh, revealed to Dr. King that um, on Mars, they exist on their, their normal plane, which is higher than this plane, uh, certainly now anyway. They exist on their normal plane, referred to as the physical, for want of a better term, although it may not be the same physical as our physical. They exist there, but that they also have a counterpart on a higher plane, uh, referred to as the etheric realms of their planet. So every single Martian has this higher counterpart. And they are aware of this higher uh, counterpart. Uh, let me just find the, the exact statement. This is from that article written shortly after the event by Dr. By Dr. King. And the Martian said, we live in our etheric realms at the same time as we inhabit the physical aspect of our planet. And then Dr. King explains this as, every person on Mars is fully aware of his etheric counterpart which lives in the subtle realms. The etheric dweller is called aspect number one and the uh, physical counterpart is called aspect number two. So uh, Dr. King then asks, so the, the question is anticipated anyway, asks if the same is true on earth in some way. And the answer is yes. This applies equally to Earth. Man upon this planet has lost contact with his primary aspect. Occasionally his awareness is heightened sufficiently to enable him to receive certain flashes of knowledge from what he chooses to regard as his intuition. So we now, sitting in this room, are aspect number two. We're the secondary aspect of our full being. On a higher realm, we have an aspect number one, which is an entirely spiritual being with which we have lost contact, except when we're in a heightened state of awareness, spiritually speaking. Now, this aspect number one is the, um, well, I, I, I can't prove this, I've tried, I can't prove this from the teachings, um, but it seems to me that the, the conclusion is that this aspect number one, our aspect number one, is um, the supra-conscious, that which is above the superconscious. Uh, so let me show you now in the, the, the diagram. So this is why I did this at the bottom. You see, so we've got this, which is the super conscious. But then, this is the supra conscious. 
Yeah. So this is our secondary aspect. This is our primary aspect. And the supraconscious, and this is clearly in the teachings, is the soul. This has been said more than once. So this aspect number one, now this is where it does get a bit um, challenging. Um, and if you study carefully the, uh, Dr. King's lecture, The Four Aspects of Creation, um, it's absolutely fascinating. It does take quite a lot of work um, to get your head around it. I think finally I have begun to do that after quite a long time. I'm sure there's a lot more to it. But I, I, think, I, I think this is one aspect of, of, of what is being explained. This aspect number one is a separate being. The subconscious of us is also a being. Now what does this mean when, when Dr. King says that they are beings and yet they are part of us? I think what he's meant is that they are beings in the sense that they think independently of us. The subconscious is thinking about digestion and memory and all the things it's thinking about, the heartbeat and, and so forth. And it's doing all that without our conscious involvement at all. And the supra-conscious is thinking its thoughts too, which we'll come on to later, without our uh, conscious involvement. So we have at least three sets of thoughts that can be going on within us as one entity in these different, different facets of mind. The uh, aspect number one, the supraconscious, exists on a higher plane. This is made very clear by Dr. King. Um, what does this mean as far as we're concerned? Well. What it does not mean, I think, is it's not on sort of level five or whatever, or even a higher realm, sort of walking around and doing its own thing and admiring beautiful higher realm scenery and occasionally checking in on us and thinking, oh, God, what are they doing now? Why won't they listen to me? Here I am. I don't think it's like that at all. Um, I think it, 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 it's... It's, it's on a higher realm in the sense that it vibrates uh, in an energy sequence that corresponds to a higher plane. Um, but it's, it, it's not geographically on a higher plane doing its own thing because it, it's part of us, or rather we're part of it. Uh, it's a bit like the best, it's not a very fortunate comparison because it's rather a negative thing um, but I think it serves to help us understand it, it think of a ghost um, a ghost is um, usually rather a, a sad sort of a character who's died, doesn't realise they've died and is existing on a different probably lower energy plane than this plane but they're still here so the being is of an energy um, vibration that does not correspond to the environment it's stuck in. This is why people can't see ghosts, by and large, unless they're psychic. Because it, it's vibrating at a different uh, rate, a different frequency. Um, now that would be a lower thing. Uh, when we talk about the, the supraconscious or aspect number one, this is very much a very much higher thing. Now, we talk about having a, a, a superconscious, a higher self, a supraconscious, an aspect number one, whatever it is. But I think, in a way, a better way of looking at it is not that we have a supraconscious but that the supraconscious has a conscious 
which is us. It's not so much part of us as we are part of it. Um, it is the... Um, this sounds contradictory. It is a complete being of which we are a part. It doesn't have its own conscious mind. We're its conscious minds. This great spiritual soul with fantastic potential, wisdom, virtually all knowledge as far as we're concerned, tremendous power. But we're its conscious mind. It can only think in a supra-conscious way unless we open our minds to it. Uh, so it's functioning on a supra-conscious level, uh, but it, it can't express the full greatness of its spirituality except through our conscious mind. And if, you, if you're wondering if that's true, I mean, just think about it. Where is it? We all have one, this great spiritual uh, being. Uh, what's stopping it? There isn't like a parallel world where all these supra-consciousnesses are living and where everything is fantastic. They're waiting, as it were, for us, for our conscious minds. And they, they will function in, in um, well, in people like us anyway, they'll function through the superconscious. So you've got the sort of the little higher self, which is the superconscious, and the big higher self, which is the supraconscious. There's a very, very interesting statement. Uh, made by Dr. King when he, he says that with the fall of man um, when, when in short when, when mankind ceased well went down the ladder of evolution basically that this higher aspect must have fallen too now, that's a very very strange thing because you think this is a spiritual being the spiritual part of us. How can it have fallen? I think there's various ways to look at that. It could mean, perhaps, that it fell because we are part of it. So therefore, whatever we do is a reflection on it. Um, or it could mean that, in some way that we don't understand, that its potential, even as a supraconscious being, had to be reduced as a result of the fall of its conscious aspect. A very fascinating concept, I think. Now, what's it doing? What does it do? Well, it's certainly available for intuition, because this, this is where the intuition really comes from, or certainly the higher intuition. Now there's another thing it does which is um, extremely important, is that uh, when we die, we leave this physical body and we go to another realm uh, which may be quite similar to this realm. Again, it, it's physical, but it's at a different frequency, frequency, different energy level. And when we die there, we'd have a body there much like we do here. When we die there, uh, then um, we are ready to be reborn onto this plane. I'm cutting this very short, because it's a whole lecture in itself. Before we're reborn onto this plane, we have to go through a process which determines uh, our what our next life is going to be like. Or at least how we're kind of set up in our next lives. Because of course we have choices in, in every life, so it's not all predestined. 
but things like, for example, who your parents are going to be, what country you're going to be born in, things like that, and many other things besides, no doubt. Now this, um, how this takes place is it is a result of self-judgment. So it's the higher aspect of us that makes this judgment according to our karmic pattern, according to um, how good our karma is. Again, I'm afraid it's just a whole other subject to explain what karma is. Now, I'm sure most of you have at least some idea. Um, it, it, it's the higher aspect of us that determines um, what experiences we're going to need in our next life um, in order to evolve in the best possible way that we deserve. Um, now, I'm, I'm presuming that it is this supraconscious that does this, rather than the superconscious. It would seem very odd to me if it wasn't, but I haven't found direct reference to that. And this, uh, strange as it may sound, takes place upon the planet Saturn. Um, in this, um, we don't know quite what state we're in. I shouldn't think that we're in a, an ordinary body like even our bodies on the other planes, which are much like our bodies here. I don't think that would be going to Saturn, but I, I really don't know. There must be some kind of body, because there must be some element of physicality to it for it to travel there. Um, what happens to the rest of our minds at this time? Again, I don't really know. We d it's all left rather as a mystery to us. I suspect that it may be that the conscious mind is kind of there, but not there in the sense of being kind of locked up. Or a little bit, almost a little bit like the reverse of wh where we're at now, where it's, the c it's all about the conscious, and the superconscious isn't getting much of a look in. Kind of, kind of perhaps a little bit like the, the, the reverse of that. And we go there and... Um, we, we make this judgment uh, based on our previous life or lives uh, about what our next life is going to be like. And, and we do this with, with detachment. You know, we, it's, not a, it's not about what you want. You don't get to choose the nicest people or the, the richest area with the best schools or whatever. Otherwise, of course, everyone would want the same. Um, it's about what you need as a soul. Um, so now we're going to listen, this is, this is about 10 minutes, um, we're going to listen to um, Dr. George King describing this process, what actually happened, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, we get help, or th this higher aspect gets help um, in this process. Anyway, I'll talk a bit more about it after, after we've heard it. So Jeremy, could you dim the lights please again? I think that blue would probably be good. And let's close the eyes and sit, sit with the uh, back straight and um, try and th not just think about this but try and sort of follow it. And remember that each and every one of us has done this. You know, I thought my goodness, it's 37 years ago I went to Saturn, uh, and, and not for the first time. So, I mean, I don't think we're going to remember it, but, uh, well, not any time soon, but let's try. This is, uh, this is not some thing way off in the, f you know, the future or the dim, distant past. This is something that happens every few decades, or every time we live, anyway, oh, on this plane. Okay, let's close the eyes and uh, concentrate on this. Let's turn the lights up. Open the eyes. Isn't that amazing? So the, the soul, the supraconscious, is the will of divine spirit exerted through the mind. 
which I am assuming is the, is the primary aspect. So the will of the spirit exerted through the mind, that's the soul. What does that mean? The spirit, what is meant by the spirit, is the spark of God. That's the highest part of us. That's higher even than, 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 than the number one. That's like the zero point aspect of us because it's not in manifestation. It's above that. Nevertheless, it has will. There is such a thing as divine will. And this exerted through the mind is what we call the soul. Nevertheless, this higher self is um, it, 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 it's, it's virtually all-knowing and virtually all-powerful as far as we're concerned, but it isn't all-knowing. Uh, because if it was all-knowing, it wouldn't need to go to Saturn for help for guidance. Um, can it make a mistake? I, I don't know. It can never be bad in the sense of it's never hateful or petty or jealous. It's contrary to its nature. It wouldn't be the supraconscious if it, if it had feelings like that. Um, but it would seem that, although I don't think it could make a mistake in the way that we know a mistake, it would seem that it could make a decision that was suboptimal. Again, otherwise, why would it require the help? Um, but rather than uh, focus on the, the limitations of our highest aspects, I'd rather look at the, what this says about these beings on Saturn. Again, I think we can safely conclude that this is not on this plane of vibration. Um, I don't think Cassini is going to find any trace of anything as wonderful as this. Um, the, it, it would seem, I mean, I have to say it would seem, but I, I think it's just really brain dead obvious that the conscious mind, if we can call it that, of a perfect of Saturn is way, way above our supraconscious. Um, and they, incidentally, um, while, while on Mars they have this higher aspect on a higher realm, and we have it as well, but on Mars they're in touch with it. Uh, on Saturn, they, ha they exist on seven different planes at the same time. This is not the same for those of you who have studied the Nine Freedoms as the division of consciousness into 1,860 parts. That's a different thing entirely. This is, this is the being itself not some projection of it. The being itself on Saturn is on seven planes of Saturn, living in seven planes, fully consciously at the same time. So this, um, this process, uh, this self-judgment, is of course all about karma. Uh, I believe in astrology that Saturn is associated with karma. Is that correct, Vasha? Yeah. Which is very interesting. I'm sure astrologers don't fully realize why, but th th there is some truth in this. Um, we know that at least, well, I found reference to the fact that at least three of the perfects, the three who um, are in charge of the Saturn mission, uh, are lords of karma, but I'd be quite certain, and I think it's quite safe to conclude, that all the perfects are lords of karma. But I don't actually have a reference for that. Um, so this is an interaction with our higher self, between our higher self and a lord of karma, to interpret our karma of the past and work out what karmic lessons we need in the future. So we could perhaps say that maybe this higher aspect is um, like our, uh, the karmic aspect of our minds. That part of our minds that acts our karma out upon us. Uh, th at that stage, at least, in, in the halls of self-judgment. And then what's it doing now? Um, is it enacting that plan for us now? Is it interpreting what we do now and modifying the plan accordingly? Uh, I think the more we look at this, really, the more questions there are than answers. But they are fascinating questions. 
one thing we absolutely know is that a higher aspect of us goes to Saturn and makes very important karmic decisions. So we can, we can, we can contemplate on that and try and... Uh, well, I think there's a tremendous amount we could draw from that. So I've got a few little extras to say, um, depending on whether or not or how many questions we have. Um, but I'd like to, to conclude, just so that we don't forget the conclusion or run out of time or something, now, even if we do some more later, because the conclusion is so important. That article is called The Spiritual Nature of Man. And I remember the first time I saw that, I was a bit surprised. I thought, why isn't it the spiritual nature of beings on Mars? I didn't really even notice the bit about mankind. I thought it was all about what they were like on Mars. But the article is quite long, and that's what it's called, the spiritual nature of man. The purpose of that story, of course, is to inspire us about Mars, uh, where we, we eventually... Presumably, we, we may or will uh, advance to such a point that we can live there ourselves, not, not, not like as astronauts, but as Martian intelligences. It's a very inspiring thought. But I think perhaps even more inspiring is the fact that we are the same by nature, that we have the higher aspect too. It's just that we don't have this full awareness of it or this continual awareness of it in the way that they do. Um, so this, I think, is the, is, the greater, is the greater aspect of it. I think that's why Dr. George King called that article that. I think another interesting thing about that title is it says the spiritual nature, not the spiritual part, the spiritual nature. Our nature is fundamentally spiritual. Every single part of us, from the physical body, the subtle body, the aura, the subconscious mind, the conscious mind, the superconscious, and certainly the supraconscious, it's all spiritual in essence. There's nothing about us that is inherently perverse. Because our nature is to be spiritual beings. Even the, the conscious mind is not bad. The conscious mind has just um, has become perverse, but that is not its nature. The lower self, as I said earlier, the lower self is not inherently part of us. It's a sickness. It's not like an organ of our mind. As, as just as an aside, you know, um, talking to somebody who studied psychology quite a lot about Freud the other day, and I, 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 I'm quite interested in Freud, rightly or wrongly. He certainly got a lot wrong, um, but an interesting man, I think, nevertheless. And this idea of um, in the subconscious, um, uh, all sons want to sleep with their mothers, this, this business, that has given people probably quite some concern about the nature of the subconscious. Um, and the point is that this is wrong, because that, you know, um, incest um, uh, with, uh, between a son and a mother is a, is a perverse act uh, that is, is against nature in, in, in every way. The subconscious is not like that. The subconscious could be warped into that um, it, could be, it could be made perverse, but it is not inherently like that. There is nothing twisted. Uh, there is nothing um, bad about any aspect of us. It's simply a question of all of the parts working together and recognizing the supremacy of the higher self. If we recognize the, the supremacy of the higher self, everything else will take care of itself. The, uh, the, the, the conscious mind will be fine. Um, it's almost like the face, the front of house, um, the emissary, the functionary of this higher being, this spiritually royal intelligence. 
And if the conscious mind is thinking right, then it won't be feeding weird, perverse negativity to the subconscious. And as a result, the subconscious will be working really well. In fact, on the contrary, it'll be feeding great positivity to the subconscious, which will help it to work well. So there's a lot of talk um, about repression. There's a lot of talk about um, being yourself and um, etc. Let's just leave it at that. Um, the greatest repression, uh, the greatest denial, the greatest lie uh, that we can tell ourselves is, is, is the denial of the existence of the superconscious. Because not only is it inherently part of us and the best manifest part of us or potentially manifest part of us, but it is us. This is the being of which we are a part. Yeah? It's that way round. The, the, the secondary aspect is a part of the primary aspect, which is the absolutely complete aspect. Um, in, the, in the article, The Spiritual Nature of Man, it, Dr. King does talk quite a lot about paradox. There is a lot of paradox here. But you always get that with truth because it is, it, it's above ordinary um, thinking that, that, that functions in a, in a world of duality because this is about the one... Uh, the one divine everything really this is about this is this is this is how god made us this is what the mind of god created so let's uh, bring it to a, a a close there um just with the thought that it's tremendous truth that we are inherently spiritual beings not just that we have a God spark like everything in creation, but even as beings. This is what we are, and this is, is I can almost feel a, a relief somehow uh, as I was thinking about it last night. It's just like, wow, that's what I am after all. That's what you, everyone is. We just have to live up to it. We just have to manifest it to make it, um, to make that, that truth um, manifest on this plane.